Amen. Give the Lord praise this morning. He is worthy to be praised. I want to be the first one to wish all of you a happy day after Thanksgiving. Amen. Has the Lord been good to you this year? I, hey, guys. Uh, I'm sorry. What did I say? What did I say? It is a day, but it is after Thanksgiving, too. Okay? So check yourself. This is not, I'm not in your class. Okay? You're not the teacher here. <laughs> I just said that to see if Latrice was paying attention. And she is. <laughs> day, after, day after Christmas. I nearly said Thanksgiving again. Amen. But it is good to be here today. And, and I, I hope and pray that you had a great time with family. And, and uh, I hope you didn't spend too much or eat too much. But uh, anyway, it's, it's awesome that we uh, 2021 is almost completely in our rearview mirror. And we're excited to see what God's going to do in this upcoming year. Let's pray and invite the presence of the Lord in this, in this place today. Father, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you uh, for your love and your kindness. We're thankful, Lord, that you got us through this year. And, and Lord, we know that you have great things in store for us this next upcoming year. And we just ask, Lord, in this service today, have your way. Just pour out your spirit. I pray that you'd fill us with your spirit. Just empower us and we pray for your anointing to rest upon each one. Help us uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And, Father, just have your way. Every song, every word spoken, I pray that we'll lift up the name of Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Everyone said, you can't shake hands, but you can wave to about five or six people. You can shake hands if you want to, but <laughs> just, just greet each other. Came sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so
seated above the throne in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. All I thought.
Amen. Give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. As I think for most of us, we would describe the past couple of years has been kind of crazy. But uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that He's still I'm glad He's still on the throne. I hope I uh, pray that you guys had are having a great holiday season. I I heard the story about a, a, an older couple been married for a long time. Didn't sound like the kids were going to be able to 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 be with them for Christmas. So uh, one day the dad uh, about a week before Christmas the dad called the son and said. Uh, you know, your mom and I have been together for about 30-something years, and we're done. We've just had enough of each other. We're going to get a divorce, and uh, that's just it. The son tried to talk some sense into him, and the dad just, no, there's just not anything we can do. We're just going to go ahead and get the divorce. And the son was just panic-stricken. As soon as he got off the phone, he called his sister and said, hey, I just talked to dad. Him and mom are having problems. Don't know what we're going to do. They think they're going to get a divorce. And uh, next thing you know, they call back and, and they said, Mom and Dad, guess what? We're on the way. We got to come up. We got to talk some sense into you people. And as soon as they hung up, the dad said, well, I guess it worked. Uh, they're coming home for Christmas and they're paying for their own flight. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you didn't have to trick your kids with a Jedi mind trick, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, it is, it is good to be, be here today. And I know that we... Uh, most of us have, have spent uh, a lot of time with family and friends, and that's always a, that's always a great thing. So, you know, in, in, uh, in history, there's, there's, there's been some events that have been extremely significant. And, you know, those of you that are, that are my age, when you went to school and they, uh, would, they would talk about time, uh, you, you studied history, they used uh, two letters to describe uh, the passing of time. Uh, B.C., which stood for before Christ, and A.D., which some have, have uh, said, well, that was after death, but that's not what that stands for. A.D. Is, comes from the Latin term. Uh, I'm not even sure I can pronounce Latin very well, but since you guys don't know how it's supposed to be pronounced either, it doesn't really make any difference. Anno Domini, which means in the, in the year of our Lord. And so uh, my generation, and when we were in school, we learned uh, B.C. and A.D. Well, now the young one's coming up, if you get into university or whatever, it's not A.C., uh, or A.D. And, and B.C., now it's B.C.E., before the common error, and A.C. after the common error. So you know what? You can do uh, B.C. and A.D., or you can do uh, before the common error, after the common error. It doesn't matter. It still <laughs> revolves around his birth. <laughs> change, the, change the names any way you want to. So his coming the first time was so significant. I think to me, uh, if I could describe or if I needed to describe the birth of Jesus in one word, that would be hope. That his birth changes everything. And I'm so thankful for the hope that you and I have as followers of his 2,000 years ago. I, I rather doubt, I, I have no idea, I don't even know what I'm thinking, much less what those early uh, Bible writers were thinking 2,000 years ago. I wonder if they realized that 2,000 years later we'd still be worshiping the same Lord and, and studying the same words and, and uh, waiting for His return. So, uh, so uh, we'll probably start a series next week, but I just want to share uh, this morning about living in the end times. Just as His first coming was uh, so historically uh, important, so his second coming is going to be absolutely amazing. But his first coming prepares us for the second coming. I don't know when he's going to return, and the more I study it, I think the more I get refused, uh, the more I get refused, the more I get confused. Obviously, I'm confused this morning. The more I get confused, the more I study it, and the more I think that I know, but the older I get, the more I realize that I have more questions than answers. I, I, I do know one thing. The Bible is very clear about the fact that he is returning. The book of 1 Thessalonians, we'll, we'll be studying out of that this morning. 1 Thessalonians has some really significant verses. Oftentimes you'll hear at funerals, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, or if you hear a message on the return of our Lord, great words of hope. In 1 Thessalonians 4, when the Apostle Paul is answering a question that arose in the ancient city of Thessalonica. Now, the city of Thessalonica 
was found in what we know as present-day Greece. That city is still in existence today. I'm not sure. I don't pronounce Greek any better than I do Latin. I think it's Thessaloniki is how it's pronounced, but you can go to Thessaloniki, Greece. And so much of the, uh, those early churches are, were founded in areas that we now know as Greece and Turkey. Those were, those were the early churches. Obviously, the first church was in Jerusalem after the day of Pentecost. You know what some of you need? Some of you need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Some, turn to somebody and say, boy, you need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Because once those believers were filled with the Spirit of God, God, uh, God established the church in Jerusalem. And then when, when persecution hit, they spread. And so they took this great message. Uh, the enemy meant that for harm. The enemy brought persecution and death to several of the early church leaders thinking he was going to destroy the church. But all he did is he spread the message. How many of you know that what the enemy means for harm, God's going to turn around for good in your life? So remember that as you go into the year 2022. You've taken a few hits. Some of you have a few battle scars from the past year or two. And you've suffered tremendous losses. But I want you to know that God's not finished yet. And uh, I don't know how he does it. I don't know when he's going to do it. I just know he is going to do it. If you'll stay faithful to him, he'll turn your losses, some of your greatest losses, into the greatest blessings in your life. Amen. How many of you received that good word today? <laughs> some of you this morning look like you need some good news. <laughs> Amen. So I just want to be full of something this morning, full of good news. Or <laughs> I, want you, I want you to be encouraged. So just as his first coming was so important, so his second coming. But much of, much of, of God's word, and, and I was going to mention 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, we read those, you know, the words that Paul was answering that question, what was happening to believers. I, I, was, t I was saying a minute ago how that I, I, I wonder, I, I think it's doubtful that those early Christians would, uh, would have had the concept that 2,000 years later, Jesus still wouldn't have, have returned. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is answering a question that had arose in the church in Thessalonica about those that had died before Jesus came back. And he, he said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it begins about verse 13, he said, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. There are a lot of things, there are a lot of uh, messages that God got angels to deliver, and there are a lot of things that God sent angels to do. But this is so important to our Lord that the Lord himself is going to descend. He's not going to send an angel. The Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Did you know people of Crossroads go, go first in the rapture because the dead in Christ shall rise first? Wow. <laughs> I got jokes. I can do this all day. The Lord himself. <laughs> the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And here's the thing that Paul added, which is so interesting. He said, but we which are alive and remain. It's almost as if the Apostle Paul was expecting the Lord to return in his lifetime. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So understand that the first coming prepares us for the second coming. And as much hope as the first coming gives us, there's an expectancy that we have about his second coming because he is coming soon. So after that great revelation that Paul gives us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're actually going to begin begin in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and begin reading with verse number 1. So how many of you know that when God's going to do something significant in the world, he tries to prepare people? He tries to prepare us. And so these are words of encouragement for us. And as we are transitioning, you know, things come to an end. One day our lives, our journey down here is going to come to an end. This year is coming to an end, and we're getting ready to go into 2022. Uh, so I don't know. Can anybody tell me when is the coronavirus thing going to be over? Anybody have any idea? Uh, I keep watching Dr. Fauci, but he keeps flip flopping. So I don't know what the heck's going on with that. If, if he's your hero, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to crush your, your life and your dreams, but, uh, I, I don't think any man really has a grasp on what's happening in this world today, but I know God's still on the throne. Amen. Whatever happens, he's still on the throne. He's still He's still going to take care of you. So the Apostle Paul, now that he's given the Thessalonians this one, these wonderful words of promise, and, and he ends that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with these words, wherefore comfort one another with these words. He's coming back. You know, tradition tells us that the early church, they greeted each other with the phrase or with the word that says Maranatha. You know what that word means, Maranatha? Our Lord comes. The, the Baptist got it. Thank you, Brother Ernie. The Baptist. 
Maranatha, they greet each other with those words, Maranatha, which means our Lord comes. And some of the last words the Apostle John writes in the book of Revelation, he says, even so, come, Lord Jesus. I'm ready for him to come. I just know there's a lot of folks that are not ready, but I want to be ready. I've made up my mind that I'm going, I'm going to do my best to be ready. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is a term that's used throughout the New Testament, which means the return of the Lord, the end times, and the coming of the Lord, and those events that were revolving around the coming of our Lord. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. The New Testament writer's description of the end times, it's a little bit, it's a little bit disturbing. When you get over in the book of Revelation, you begin to read uh, the things that will be happening in the end times. It's a little bit frightening. Matthew 24, when Jesus is answering a question from his disciples, and, and Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13 are all different accounts of the same conversation that took place, but, but they were remarking, they were standing there, they were seeing Herod's temple. It wasn't Solomon's temple, it was Herod's, uh, Herod had rebuilt Solomon's temple, and they're standing there looking, Herod was, Herod was a crazy man. I don't know if you know much about Herod, if you studied much about, Herod was, uh, my Hispanic friends say, loco en la cabeza, I mean, he was cuckoo for cocoa puffs. In fact, the Caesar at that time said it's safer to be Herod's pig than it is to be one of his kids because Herod actually had some of his, sin, some of his sons killed because he, per, he perceived them as a threat. Herod was a crazy man, but he, he, he was very known for architecture and for building, and he built Herod's, he, he re, Herod's temple was a re, rebuild of Solomon's temple. But it was very impressive, and the disciples are standing there, and they are admiring the stones of the temple and Jesus turns to him and says, there's coming a day when there will not be one stone left upon the other. And they were stunned. The disciples were stunned. Wait, wait, because they knew what that meant. That's not, that's not good news. When the terrorists hit us on, on, in 9-11, when the terrorists hit us back then, one of the planes went down in Pennsylvania. And I think that that plane, I'm not sure, but I think they think that plane was headed for the White House. Well, you can imagine, as, an, as, as Americans, we don't really have one church building that's, that signifies or symbolizes our faith. And, and for Jewish people, that temple that was built, that initially that Solomon built and then Herod rebuilt, that temple was sort of a symbol of their, of their faith and such. We don't really, as, as American Christians, we don't really have that. But as Americans, you know what it would mean if that plane had crashed in and demolished the White House. It's not so much the it's not the brick and the mortar and the wood, but, but it's what it signifies. So when those disciples, when Jesus says, there's not even going to be one stone left upon the other, immediately, it's interesting because the disciples said, well, what is going to be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? New, the, the King James Version says the end of the world, but it, the proper trans, uh, rendition of that is end of the age. Or They just realized there was something so significant about that if the temple would be destroyed. And so Jesus was going through all these lists, wars and rumors of wars, Pestilence, you know what pestilence is? Epidemics. Jesus said epidemics would be a, a sign of the end time. There would be, there would be uh, famines and earthquakes and all those things. But I think it's around verse 6 of Matthew 24 when Jesus is listing all these bad things that will be happening in the end times. He says, but see that you be not troubled. Now, when we see all these things going on around us, we see the epidemics and and we see the violence that's happening. And we see the division in our country. And those of us that have been around for a while. And those of us that know history. And you see things the way that they're playing out. And it brings tremendous concern to your heart and to your life. And I think it's okay to be concerned. To be concerned about our families. To be concerned about our communities. To, to be very concerned about our nation. I'm going to tell you something. We have, we have Christians on both sides that are rallying around political parties. And I think it's interesting because when a politician runs, especially for re-election, he's saying, re-elect me to solve the problems that I've been causing. Because government is not the answer. And whether, whether you're for the orange man or for shrill Hillary, whatever, I mean, whoever you were for, they were never the answer. Jesus is the answer for this world. And we've got to keep our eyes upon him. And so I think it's okay to be concerned about our country 
and to be, be concerned about our world. But, you know, these things that we see playing out are really, really concerning. Uh, Jesus, uh, and as, as he prepared us in Matthew 24 and the other gospel writers uh, here, as we read Paul's writings to the Thessalonians, we realize that God's word always provides two things. Number one, it provides us a warning, a warning. God's word is a warning. Jesus said, you don't know the day or the hour of my return, but he leaves us signs. And he said, when you begin to see these things happen, lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. Jesus was so, he was so frustrated with the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, how, how is it that you can look at the sky and you can discern the weather from the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times? And they were oblivious. They were clueless when it came to the first coming of Jesus. But I wonder if the spirit-filled church, if we are just as clueless about his second coming. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you'll be raptured. That seems to be the motto of the church today. How many of you have loved ones that are not ready? That ought to bring, look, I, I believe that we ought to live a joyful life. I think our lives ought to be celebration. But there ought to be a part of our lives that are grieving for people that are not ready for the things that are, that are about to take place. God's word gives us, it's, it's a warning, but it also gives us a way of escape. Jesus said his return would be as a thief in the night. He'd he would return at a time when we least expect him. And so in preparation for the circumstances that we'll be facing in these end times, there are seven verses at the end of 1 first, first Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to go through these seven verses, and they're all very, very short verses. So it won't take us very long to get through, through these. But how many of you know God's Word has an answer for you today? Some of you are looking for answers. And you've been looking at Dr. Phil and Oprah and everyone else. But I'll tell you something, man. God's Word has the answers for your life. And will speak truth. And not only truth, but encouragement and comfort. I want you to be strengthened and comfort and encouraged today. Because God's Word will still speak to us today. 1 Thessalonians, and we'll start with verse 16. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Uh, a lot of these verses we can have memorized. How many of you are ready to, to, to memorize God's Word? How many of you went to Sunday school and you, and you got a candy or something if you memorized God's Word? Come on. You went to Sunday school? Okay, or children's church or whatever. I don't, have, I don't have any candy, but Randall's here, and for every one of you can memorize a verse, he's going to give you a $20 bill. So, <laughs> round of applause for Randall. Come on. Come on, guys. He's, yeah, I think that grin is saying, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. So, First, first, first Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, that, this is interesting because, okay, he's talking about all the things that are happening and, and all the, the difficult times, and uh, he's talking about that, you know, peace and security or peace and safety and then sudden destruction will come. And then, <laughs> and then he says this, but rejoice always. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. So Jesus is sitting with his disciples, what we know is a Thursday night. Jesus would be hanging on the cross by Friday. After, by Friday. And so his last night with the disciples, and he's going through all these terrible things that are about to happen, but he starts off this discourse that he has with them. He said, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Their lives were getting, were getting ready to be wrecked. <laughs> I mean, they were about to see their Lord crucified, strike the shepherd, the sheep, the sheep will scatter, you know, a, a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Their world was, was going to spin out of control. They had given up everything for three years. They had followed Jesus. They had given up everything. They had, you know, they had done exactly what Jesus asked them to do. They had given up their lives to follow him. And now their Lord is about to, to, to be crucified in front of him. And, he's tell, and on top of that, he's saying, one of, you, one of you is going to betray me. It just gets worse. This night is getting worse. But Jesus starts, out, oh, yeah, but by the way, don't let your heart be troubled. And that, so I think it's beautiful sometimes that God in his word, he, he forewarns us about things that are happening, especially in these end times. But he's saying, hey, guys, don't be troubled. See that you be not troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. The writer of the book of Hebrews says in the last days that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So that those things that cannot be shaken will remain. So there's going to be a shaking. There's, I, I've, never actually, I've never actually been through a, a, an earthquake. 
Uh, it's not on my bucket list. Hopefully, you know, things like that just don't happen in Texas. It, this happens in California. It's all those, where all those crazy people are. God's trying to shake them. God, oh, they're from California? God bless you. We love you. Oh, there's, there's, a, there's, a few, there's a few good people in, from California, and they just happen to be here in our service. <laughs> Sorry, we pick on California all the time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, sometimes we pick on New York, so we, we cut you guys slack. <laughs> I've never, been, I've never been through an earthquake. It's not on my bucket list, but I, I, I would imagine it's pretty scary to, to feel the ground underneath you begin to move. But in spite of all that, the, the Apostle Paul said, rejoice always. Which brings me to an important point. Living with joy is a choice. Every morning you wake up, think about this. Listen, we need to own this. We need to own our own lives. We need to take responsibility. Every morning I wake up, I'm choosing my mindset for the day. Oh, well, you know, you don't know what I'm going through. Hey, we all have, we all have drama. We all have stuff we're facing. Uh, I know sometimes, and I'm not in any way trying to minimize or diminish the, the, the struggles that you're going through or, or suggest that they're not, you know, life-altering or life-changing. But every day, regardless of what I go through, I get to choose the mindset and the attitude that I'm going to have. And I can choose every day. That doesn't mean just because I try to choose it, it's going to happen easily. Sometimes that's that spiritual battle that's going to take place. Guys, you're going to go through a battle. Why don't you choose to win that battle? Can I get amen on that? Because whether you choose to win or lose, you're going to go through that battle. So if we decide that we're going to rejoice always, we don't rejoice because we have joy we have joy because we re we rejoice that prefix re means again right rejoice so it's just you know some of you this morning you're here and you have you have it's like a tape recorder in your mind that just goes non-stop i am worthless things i can't catch a break things are terrible things are horrible no, I, nothing's ever going to get better in my life why don't you replace that and put a new recording and say this is the day the lord has made i'm going to rejoice and i'm going to be glad in it i'm going to rejoice always and in philippians he said rejoice in the lord always and again 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 i say rejoice so choose every Every day, as Paul said, rejoice always. It, you know, it's not hard to rejoice when things are going good, but what about when things are going bad? That's when it's a test of the faith, right? That's when it's a test of faith. And a lot of times people come to church and they worship God, and their worship of God is based upon their circumstances. Well, I had a really well, rough week. I'm just going to sit here, and I'm going to feel sorry for myself. Or I've had a rough week, and I'm going to sit here and be anxious about next week. Or we could just come to church and say, but, whew, this week was not good. Next week's not looking good. But I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to take a moment to worship him and praise him because he is worthy. And I'm going to rejoice because regardless of what happens, my name is written in the book of life. Amen. Give him praise this morning. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was pretty weak. We're going to hype you up on coffee a little bit more next week. So we take ownership of this. Or we can live at the mercy of our circumstances. Let's not live at the mercy of our circumstances, let's rejoice whatever we're going through. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Look at the next verse. How many of you, how many of you memorized verse 16? Without looking at it, let's say it. Rejoice always. Wow, you learned a Bible verse. I think you'll be able to do the same thing with this one. Pray without ceasing. So, I've been, I've really been for many years trying to wrap my brain around this. Does that mean we're supposed to walk around in a trance and, and we're oblivious to everything? We're just constantly, I, I don't really, I don't really think that that is the concept that the Apostle Paul, there are times that we need to find our quiet time. Uh, Jesus used the term, the prayer closet, or if you have a prayer room uh, or whatever, uh, there are times that we need to be by ourselves. Uh, Sometimes people, they, they're praying on the way to work, especially if you have a long commute, you spend that time. You, you find times to get away, sometimes corporate prayer where a group of believers get together. But I think there's also an aspect of this where we pray without ceasing, where our mind is upon him. Uh, this is, I always felt, thought this was very fascinating. So in the biblical languages, spirit and breath is the same word. In both, in the Greek, pneuma, and, and uh, pneuma is a Greek word, and, and we have English you know, words that from that, that root word, like pneumonia, which is infection in, in the lungs, or pneumatic drill, which is, which is powered by wind, right? Uh, so uh, 
breath and spirit are the same. Uh, and, and so pneuma in, in, in the Greek in the Old Testament is ruach. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I don't know Latin. I don't know Greek. And I don't know Hebrew. Ruach. And so it, it, it's almost the picture of when the Bible says that God breathed into Adam. That was the ruach. And he became a living soul. He breathed into him. And when he breathed in him, spirit and life was found in Adam. It's the same thing in the New Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration. Or in the newer translations, it says all scripture is God breathed. God breathed upon those men. It was his spirit. And I think praying without ceasing. And, and I, so this is something I do. I do little mind. I do little mind tricks because. Uh, I told Latrice that a moment ago when she was correcting me because I didn't know what day it was, I said, you're not my teacher, but she probably should be because I think like a fifth grader. So I always do little things to try to help me remember. And so to pray without ceasing, I think about, I think about breathing in and breathing out. You know, and, and most of the time, none of us think about breathing until you're struggling to do it. If you've ever, ever had pneumonia, actually had pneumonia, or you've ever had some type of infe respiratory infection, or some of you that maybe have had to, to have, have uh, been through COVID or whatever, and it affected your breathing a little bit. You don't really think about breathing. And so I consciously sometimes think about breathing and think about the breath of God. And I pray as I breathe in. I, I, I don't know if I'm the only one that does stuff like this, but I do this to try to help me stay focused. And I believe that's what praying without ceasing is, that it becomes as natural to you as breathing. You see, because when God, when, when God came down in the cool of the evening, uh, in, in the Garden of Eden uh, with, with Adam and Eve. He didn't have all these rituals and all these traditions. You know denominations are man-made, right? Denominations, so many of the rituals and so many of the traditions, they're man-made, and, and many of them are well-intended, but there was none of that in, in the Garden of Eden. God just came down with Adam and Eve, and he walked with them. And he just spent time with them. And I think, you know, uh, when uh, I, I know, so we, uh, we have some married people here today, and, uh, you know, some of you have a very strange relationship because you act like you love each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so uh, there, there's a few of you couples who have been married for a while that we have to be careful. If we show videos or whatever. Then uh, we turn out the lights. They start kissing. And it's just like it's sort of make it weird for the rest of us. Like, no, this is church. Stop that. But <laughs> but <laughs> some of you remember, uh, especially when you were first engaged or whatever, and or you first met that person and. You thought about that person all, all, the, all the time, right? Because that person, there they, they was just that chemistry, and, and it's, they captured your heart, right? And, and because the, it, they had such a profound effect upon you, I think that's the way our relationship with Christ ought to be. I think we ought to be so acquainted with the love of God that it's not, it's not just a discipline. It's not just, oh, I forced myself. It's just a natural, it's just like breath that we think about him and throughout the day. And we think about, we think about his goodness. And we think about, and there are times, what, multiple times a day when we're going through a task or we're, we're facing something that's difficult, we just breathe a prayer and say, Lord, give me, give me strength. I find myself the older I get, praying about just everything, because I don't know about you, but I need serious help. Can I get amen there? <laughs> so let's see if, we got, we, if you, got, you guys got that one memorized. Let's try it. Pray without ceasing. All right. Some of you are really struggling. You're doing, pray with, you're doing it with your fingers. This one will be a little bit harder for you to memorize. Verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And we just came off a series about being thankful. We, we were reading Psalms 100, a psalm of thanksgiving. And here again, we find words of encouragement, again, to be thankful. Paul did not say, give thanks for all circumstances. Not everything that comes into your life is sent from the Lord. Understand, re re remember who your enemy is. Jesus said, there's a thief that comes before to steal kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But we're not thankful for all circumstances, but we can be thankful in all circumstances. Thankful for what God's brought us through. Thankful he's going, he's going to bring us through. And we're thankful because we're blessed, but we're also going to be greatly blessed because we're thankful. See how it just kind of feeds off of when you're joyful, you have joy, and when you have joy, you're going to be joyful. Replace all that negative thinking and all that, those toxic emotions with joy and, and being thankful. It'll literally change your life. Let's move to this verse 19. Do not quench 
the Spirit. There is a very important role of the Holy Spirit in your life. But many times we extinguish the flames of the passion. See, I believe that our Christian life, our walk, should be des described by fire and by passion uh, in serving him. So we have so many times people that sit on church pews or chairs or whatever, and they're not passionate in their faith. They're not passionate. They're just kind of going with the flow. And, and I just think that he wants us to be passionate about our faith, passionate about loving him, passionate about serving him. And we have next Sunday is, will be our first Sunday of the, of the new year. And in and, and January, we're going to be we're going to be launching some uh, some uh, some plans for the upcoming year and for hopefully for God to use us in a great way in our community. But we cannot afford to quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, I don't want to belabor this point, but let me just tell you, there's two there's there's two spirits that that are in this world, well, three, including the human spirit. But there's one or two spirits that's working in your life today. There we don't know uh, spend as much time talking about the Antichrist, the first century church, it seemed like that was a very common topic because all the, most of the first century or a lot of those guys wrote about the Antichrist. And John said that uh, the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. We don't know who the Antichrist is, but the spirit of Antichrist. So guys, it's, it's the spirit of this world or the spirit of Antichrist that's working in your life or it's the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I don't know which one. Read Galatians chapter 5. And Paul, he just beautifully describes, and he, there's a whole list of the works of the flesh. I know some of you are going to go, and you're going to go look, look and see if there's a list of sins to see if there's any that you missed. I don't recommend that strategy, but you go back and you look. You look at the, at the works of the flesh, and you see all the confusion, and all the pain, all the suffering, and all those things. But the Apostle Paul said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So you'll know which Spirit's working in your life by the evidence of what's happening. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20, do not despise prophecies. We serve a supernatural God. He does supernatural things. But many times prophecy, when uh, prophecy uh, in the Old Testament, it was men that would many times foretell future events. In the New Testament, prophecy is more of, of a man or a woman being a mouthpiece for God. Just speaking the word of God doesn't always necessarily have to be a future event. So when somebody had a gift of prophecy or when somebody spoke with a prophetic word, many times it was just words of exhortation or words of comfort. We're living, guys, we're living in a time where people, uh, when people want to cherry pick God's word. And it's so interesting when I talk to people that everybody tends to try to define who Jesus was in a way that will not offend their lifestyle. Because our number one thing is we don't want anybody to be offended. I don't know about you, but there are times I need to be offended. There are times that I, sister, you didn't have to be so aggressive about that. There, <laughs> there, are, times, there are times that I, and what I mean by that, not offended in the sense that, that somebody, not, not, not offended in the sense that somebody was trying to be rude or anything, but offended in the sense that I need the Holy Spirit, I need the convicting power of the Holy Spirit working in my life. And in the church, we're rejecting that because we're accepting a very politically correct version, a very watered down version where nobody's offended. It's interesting, Jesus said, blessed are those that are not offended in me. And there, are, there was a reason why they crucified him. The most loving, the most kind, the most compassionate, the, the, the most tender person that ever lived. There's a reason why they crucified him, because he spoke the truth. And people don't like to hear the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil, and he was the light. And when you are sitting in darkness and light, the lights are turned on. It can be very painful to your eyes. And for, for many of us, it can be, it can be painful. So when God speaks, and I know I'm, I'm looking at this from a little bit different application. The Apostle Paul obviously was talking about prophecy in the sense that we, we need to accept the word of the Lord. But I'm trying to personalize this as, as we step into this new year. Let's receive God's word. And let's not try to change God's word to accommodate us. Let's allow God's word to change us to accommodate God's will in our life. Man, Twitter, you should Twitter that hashtag. That was pretty good. We should not try to change God's word to accommodate us. We should allow God's word to change us, to accommodate his will in our lives. Verse 21, but test everything, hold fast to what is good. If the enemy was to appear in your life today or appear before you, 
He would not appear as some hideous, demonic creature to try to scare you. It's not how he appears. Rarely, rarely does that happen. Rarely does evil want to manifest itself in that way. The Apostle Paul wrote, and that Satan appears, he transforms himself into an angel of light. He appears in a way to, to deceive us. And he can bring people in our lives to get our eyes off Jesus. He can bring circumstances. He can try to open doors for us. He can try to get us to walk through a door. Then instinctively on some level we think, well, that's what I want. But on some level we kind of know that's really not what's best for my relationship for, with him. And I think as followers of Jesus, we need to get back to where we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness instead of, you know, we just rationalize everything and we excuse everything and we just make excuses for everything and this and that and this person did this. None of that stuff matters. What matters, am I putting him first in my life? Because if I put him first, if I seek first his kingdom, all the things that I need are going to be added unto me. And it can be very difficult sometimes because all of us have been in situations where it's like, ah, I'm struggling with this. And we think, is this, is, you know, is it okay for, is okay for me to do this? But I promise you, take a step back, spend time in God's word, pray. You should come talk to extremely brilliant, wise people. You got my cell number, call anytime. Not the middle of the night, though. But seriously, though, there are times that you need to go talk to someone that you admire, that you, they have tremendous wisdom and sometimes bounce that off of them. That, that's such an important uh, opportunity that we have as followers of Jesus to try to help us find the will of God. And we'll, we'll conclude with this, verse 22. Abstain from every form of evil. Abstain from every form of evil. God is not going to change his word to accommodate this generation. It's not, he's not going to change things to accommodate the political views of this generation and what they're getting out of our universities. He's not, he's not going to change his word. His eternal values are never going to change. And I want to say this because I, you know, so much of what people are doing, they label under grace. Well, grace, it's not, it's not legalism, it's grace. But I want to conclude with this. Obe obedience to God's word is not legalism. Legalism is when I try to come up with a list of do's and don'ts that the Bible does not cover, but I, I try to project my preferences over you and your life and tell you, well, you got to wear your hair this way. I think all of you ought to wear your hair this way, women included. Just go home and shave the middle of your head, you know, or, or you have to listen to certain music or you have to believe this exactly, you know. That's what legalism is. But obedience to God's word is not legalism and disobedience is not grace. And we have a whole generation of Christians that are coming up that say, well, grace, I'm under grace. I'm doing all these things. Okay, maybe against God's word, but grace. If you step out, if you step out of an area of obedience to God's word, you can cry grace all you want to. And I'm thankful for his grace and I'm thankful for his forgiveness. But the problem is, if you don't think there's anything wrong with it, you're not going to ask for forgiveness. And if you don't ask for forgiveness, there is no forgiveness. And so let's approach in these last days, let's live and let's, let's watch and pray. You know, the Apostle Paul said that we need to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. And notice the, the, those two terms, with fear and trembling. We, uh, there are some things that we just need to be really sober. We need to really pay attention to. And this is definitely one of them. Father, thank you, Lord, for the promises that we have in your word. And we're thankful, Lord, because we know that you are returning soon. And you're coming at a time when you least expect. As when, we, when we least expect. And you said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of my return. But yet, Father, you give us your word to warn us and to prepare us. And we can be prepared if we are obedient to you. And Father, I just pray for any needs represented in our church family. I pray, God, for those if you're having physical problems, I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would encourage them tremendously, that we'll live in your hope, knowing, God, that you're still in control. Lord, for those that in their families, for, for many it was a very difficult season, their first time to face the holidays without a loved one. And yet I pray, Father, that their lives 
will be graced by your peace and your comfort. Lord, for those that are having issues in their family and struggling, I pray, Lord, for relationships that, uh, that have been damaged. I pray, God, that you would bring peace uh, and love and forgiveness and grace to each one of those relationships. And I pray, God, that each one of us will step out of this place and we will go out into our mission field and we will be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, that we'll let our light so shine before men that they'll see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed today.